So this is Rohit, I'm one of the AI scientists and I'm going to talk about why AI and why scientists and all of those things in a while. Uh, but before I talk about AI, I just want to talk about something uh, very different actually. So before I go to AI, I want to talk about this serial killer across India. I mean, probably you don't get to hear about him on this newspaper and all of this. And definitely this is not the person who is shown in the image, but person at the thing that I'm talking about is called tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is one of the biggest uh, healthcare problems in India right now. Uh, last year itself, there were around roughly 10.4 million cases reported globally, out of which 2.79 cases of TB were reported in India. And you know what is the stunning part of this entire tuberculosis problem? This is that the, the problem is completely solvable. The disease is completely solvable and curable by medicine. And still, despite of that, we lost 4,23,000 people in India to tuberculosis last year. If you look at this current map, right, it talks about what are the most, uh, you know, most common places across India where you would normally see tuberculosis. And as, as I mentioned earlier, so out of the global incidence of TB, uh, India has the largest incidence. And it's not without reason that India is called the TB capital of the world. I mean, we normally want to, India, we as, as a nation, we want to be sort of at the top of all the things that we want to achieve in uh, terms of sports and uh, other things. But unfortunately, uh, this is something that we top the globally, right? Globally, all the cases of TB that you would note, India is at the top of it, right? And something that we are not absolutely proud of. Now, what is the more tougher problem about the entire TB diagnosis case? So if you look at the total number of cases uh, globally that were reported, out of that, only 6 million cases were reported and diagnosed. What about the rest 4 million cases? Those 4 million cases were not even diagnosed. And now that's the more troublesome problem about tuberculosis. Because tuberculosis is a contagious disease. The moment you do not diagnose a person with TB, he's spreading TB to 15 more people annually. So TB, the major problem that you have around is not only about curation, the bigger problem is sort of diagnosing TB at the correct point of time. Now, with most of the things that we do in India, uh, we would tend to think that probably government is the one that is to be blamed for all of this, but probably in this case, it's not. So let's try and understand what government had done for you know, tuberculosis prevention across since 1993. That's when WHO had declared tuberculosis as an epidemic, and WHO had declared that we need to sort of figure out steps to fight TB. So 1993, this was a central planning commission that was formed which is called RNTCP, which was dedicated completely and solely to the purpose of tuberculosis fighting in India. After that, so this committee had sort of all kinds of plans that it had put off all these years, right? And then 2006 to 11, they ran extensive programs to sort of uh, do screening at, you know, at very remote areas within India and outside India, as, I mean, within India and you know, in multiple major cities as well as in uh, distant villages as well. Now the major problem with this 2006 to 11 phase was that uh, though the coverage of the program increased, but the quality of tests that was used to sort of screen for TB was not really good. And that's when in 2012 to 17 they sort of came up with the idea, you know what, let's try and change the kind of tests that we use for tuberculosis and let's try and use x-rays to sort of you know detect tuberculosis. Earlier it was a skin test that you would normally do to detect tuberculosis. And they said that that, that probably sounds like a good idea. But unfortunately, that also did not work out well. And let's try and hear it from one of the patients uh, whom we've had. So this is a story of Ratan Singh. He was uh, near around, this is, he's based out of a village, a distant remote village near Baran district in Kota. And let's hear from him why this sort of plan of the government during the 2012-17 phase did not work out as well. डॉक्टर साहब के इलाज के लिए और डॉक्टर साहब से जब दिखवा लेते हैं तो जांच लिखते हैं तो जांच कोई कहते हैं जब पांच दिन बाद मिलेगा कोनो कहते हैं कि दस दिन बाद मिलेगा जब पांच दिन दस दिन बाद भी आते हैं तो एक जांच मिलता है और एक जांच फिर कहते हैं कि दस दिन बाद आई इस तरीका से हम लोग को बहुत बड़ा पर परेशानी बढ़ जाती है हम लोग सौ दो कमाने वाले हैं और यहाँ खर्च जो है तो आने जाने में भी पाँच सौ पड़ता है हम लोग लाएंगे कहाँ से so as you could clearly see, the major problem here was the delay in diagnosis. So currently in the chest x-ray process, what was happening is that they were asked to come multiple times. 
and this multiple times so you would come for the first time do an x-ray and then they would ask you to come 10 days later to collect the report and if there was something that was positive about it then you have to sort of come again after another 10 days to come the gather collect the report of another test right so now as you already heard right these are daily laborers who are working in remote parts there as he's mentioned it's just earning 100 or 200 rupees a day and you have to travel all the way to this district medical hospital where you have to do this test and that travel itself took him 500 rupees right so there was a clear problem where you know despite all our best efforts we really couldn't do it and there was a major problem was the delay in diagnosis part now if you look and try and understand why was this delay in diagnosis a major problem so in us you have one radiologist for around a population of 10000 people in india that number is one for one lakh people. That's a 10 times deficit we have in India. And that, that's not unnatural as well. I mean, we are a huge population country. We don't produce as many doctors. We don't have as many medical institutes probably as US has. But that's, that's, that's a sad reality. And that's a system problem. I mean, uh, government putting funding and everything, you really cannot solve that until and unless you need some technical innovation to sort of completely change the perspective there, right? So this is where enters our superhero AI. So AI is this, is this wonderful thing that sort of completely changed how tuberculosis detection is currently done. And this is across multiple places in North India where this is already implemented. So if I just walk you through how AI sort of changed the workflow. So currently the patient comes in, does the chest x-ray, and that probably, uh, you know, the patient goes upstairs somewhere, it's taking the x-rays done. And then as soon as the x-ray is done, within two seconds, the AI predicts if there's a tuberculosis probability of that patient or not, right? And as soon as it does that, if the TB is detected, we do a confirmatory test right there at that point in time. And within next four to five hours, you have got your medication started for that patient. So what earlier normally, as you heard the patient say, would took normally two weeks or three weeks, suddenly has reduced down to four hours, five hours. That's why AI is our superhero out here, right? But how did we get there? I mean, look at me. I'm a computer scientist. If you had told me way back in my 10th or 12th that, you know, I'm going to have to deal with medicine or anything that had closely remotely to do with medicine, I would have freaked out. And it would still have. And I had no clue about medicine, right? So how did we, how did we build systems, AI, that we call, right? So what is AI, right? So first, let's understand there. So to understand AI, let's talk about something again widely different. Let's talk about, let's going for a movie, right? So if you have to go for a movie tonight, and if I have to go, for example, most easiest thing that I would look at is say, how is the movie rated? And if the rating for the movie is around eight, I said, that sounds like a good movie. Let me go ahead for that. Now, if there is, then that's just one of the parameters, right? But then I could be someone who's a bit more complex as a person. I don't look at just ratings. I also look at what is the price. And then with price, it's an inverse relationship, right? The higher the price, lower my intensity or preference to go for it. So what you see here out on mark on in the red, right? The numbers two and minus 10. So that sort of talks about my preference for those parameters, right? So if, if I, I really care a lot about, for example, uh, I care about the price, right? So that's why the number and I really don't want to go for a movie, it's extremely highly priced. So that's my minus 10. Uh, with rating, I'm probably not as much, I don't care as much. So it's roughly around zero, which is what is CS2. Now, obviously, if you have multiple more parameters that comes in weather, and for example, weather I really care about. So that's case, I have a seven out of 10 rating, right? For how, how much, you know, how much I care about the weather. So if you take all of those features into consideration, so you would basically be able to calculate out a preference score, which is roughly like, you know, you just take a multiplication of the input and the preference that you have for that input. So if you do that, and in this case, it turns out that it's greater than zero. So then you decide you want to go for a movie. Now, suppose this is all about when you knew about what my preferences were. But suppose you did not know what my preferences were and you were asked to guess, you know, would I go for a movie or not, given these are the parameters. How would you do that? So in that case, you would need a list of what are my preferences for different movies, and from that, you would try and guess what my preferences for each of those parameters would be, right? So you would have a data which would look sort of like this. You would have a movie, the corresponding review, weather, price, variables for each of those, and finally, whether I did actually go for that movie or not. And how you would normally do is, and this is, 
absolutely what AI is actually all about, right? So there are three steps to sort of getting that, guessing that process, right? So first is you would start off with a random set of numbers, right, for my preference. You do not know. So what do you do? You just start off with a random number. So then with that, you would probably predict what is my likely decision. And then obviously that would not be correct. So then you would measure what is the error in that decision. And based on what is the error, if the error is very high or if the error is low, you would accordingly make changes to my preference code that you randomly assigned. And you do this multiple times. And that's exactly how you would guess my preference. And this is exactly, in the most simplest terms, what AI is all about. It's all about guessing the preferences given particular features. Now, just to sort of talk about something which is a bit more technical, which is what is deep learning, and that's exactly what is you call AI most of these days. So if you have a lot of this kind of network layers and there's, there's a depth to that, you would normally call that as a deep learning. And this is what makes AI very powerful. Instead of sort of looking at a fixed combination, the AI sort of can now learn what are the different possible combination of features that need to be combined in what different ways to calculate the exact preference score for each of these movie ratings, for example, right? And this is the exact same technique that we use for teaching AI to read x-rays. Now, x-ray, you would ha what, how normally x-rays would look like is this, that you would have an image and you would have a corresponding rating of whether that was a tuberculosis case or not. And these images are normally represented as pixels, which is nothing but input features like movie rating, review, and whether I had used in the earlier example. So if you use that, and you sort of train a neural network, which is what is a technical term for that you know, slightly uh, technical diagram that I had shown earlier. And that is what is called deep learning, right? So the idea is this, that you would have a lot of images and a corresponding label of whether it was tuberculosis or not. And every time it sort of makes an error, you sort of penalize that network and make it more accurate as you train multiple times over. And that's fairly what we had used to train millions, around 1.2 million cases we had of chest x-rays and the corresponding image, corresponding value of whether there was a tuberculosis case or not, right? And similarly, we had done a similar exercise for detecting emergency cases from head CT scans, so CT scans taken from the head. And that we had researched and published in the Lancet, which, is, which happened to be India's first ever AI research paper published in any medicine journal. So that was a big moment for us that happened in October 2018. But this is all fine. Uh, my message that I wanted to sort of convey you to you as budding AI scientists as you sort of go out in that career, what are the three, four things that we, and I'm going to talk about three top takeaways that I learned while building these AI systems across the last two, three years. So the first is AI is not just math or it's just not code. In fact, AI is science, and that's why I prefer to call myself as an AI scientist because like other things in science, there's a, there's a thesis that you start off with, then you try and measure and observe, and then you sort of correct for that. And that's exactly how deep learning systems are built. It's just not you writing a page of, of you know, scripts after scripts and sort of, uh, or you just probably formalizing theoretical maths on your laptop. That's not AI. AI is a lot more bigger than just, you know, writing five lines of code. So, that's something that I want you to take and kind of take into cognizance that AI is broadly a design subject as well. You have to sort of design how the networks look like. Every time the model is not performing, you sort of have to go back and understand why it did not work and you know, sort of take care of all of those things. So just, so while this is a good news for most of you guys, because uh, I mean, most of you won't be afraid of maths or code or whatnot, right? But this sort of might give you more hope that AI is bigger than that. You know, you can be probably someone who's not completely comfortable with coding or someone who's not completely comfortable with maths, but you can still go out and build this because at the end of the day, it's actually that strategic thinking that sort of is, takes a much bigger chunk of your work than rather just coding a few things. But obviously, given having said all of that, you still require some kind of maths and coding background to sort of get there easily, but that's not just it. The second thing that we learned while building this AI system is that as you know, and it's a general tendency among software engineers globally that you sort of build systems sitting within that cubicle and you think that that's probably your entire world around you. But sadly, that's not AI all about. We learned that while we were building the systems, we had to talk to a lot of radiologists day in, day out, understand how they make decisions. 
and sort of take that back into our work and reflect that in our designing of the systems. And that's true with almost every AI problem that you would ever work with. It's never ever about just sitting in your cubicle and coding. If you don't know how the world works, you probably might not be even able to model it. So the biggest advice that I always say to AI guys, budding AI scientists is, is please, please, please go out, explore how people actually doing that decision currently are using their decision making uh, tools and then model your architectures, model your understanding of the world around that and that's when you would be able to build successful AI systems. Just don't sit in a cubicle and try and build softwares. That definitely doesn't work. And the final most important thing that I wanted to say is that don't keep your AI building of AI products just limited to research papers or you know just a software. Uh, building AI is important, it's tough. Uh, as in building that software product. But even what is more tougher is sort of taking that out in a real life system and deploying it to save lives. Because that's where, where it counts. I mean, you guys are all great engineers. I'm sure you guys would be able to build out fantastic AI systems. But just don't stop there. Just don't stop where you have built AI system. Take it out in the real world. Take it out to solve real problems. Because that's when you get to understand how sort of things work out in the real life and you know what are the different challenges. And that's a completely different challenge. Just keeping that, keeping that in mind, I'll just talk about the final bit, which is this example we had, uh, is a story, again, one final story about how we had implemented AI. So this is, this is a hospital way down in Kerala. Uh, this is busy hospital, busy trauma center. So trauma center means you have patients coming in with trauma every moment in the day. Uh, but unfortunately, this is, uh, this is not Kochi. This is remotely near to Kochi. So they don't have as many radiologists actually sitting at the hospital throughout the day. Uh, and uh, what happened there is that they normally wanted something, so there are normally radiologists who are there at the hospitals from say 1 to 4, 1 a.m., uh, normally not 1, probably somewhere around 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the afternoon, right? After that, there are not radiologists at the, radio at the center, right? Because they have other hospitals to cater to as well. So now in this trauma center, uh, but CT, the CT scan of patients were happening throughout the day, right? Because people would have trauma, injuries, accidents, and they would have to come to the hospital right away. They can't wait that, oh, radiologist is not there, let me, you know, try coming back probably next day. That won't happen. So you have scans happening throughout the day, but the radiologists are not there throughout the And so we said that, you know what, uh, we can use AI to sort of detect everything that is going on, and probably we can send you an automated report and everything. And that was fantastic, right? Because suddenly now they have the capability to look at those scans. Because earlier they would be looking at the scans next day in the morning. And imagine a bike accident patient sort of waiting at the trauma center, admitted to the hospital, and they don't know if there's a hemorrhage in their brain until the next day in the morning. That's really sad. So now with AI, we could suddenly solve that problem where we could say that, you know what, if there's a hemorrhage and that we can detect as soon as the patient comes in, you can directly go and do the surgery right away. And that was the brilliance of AI. But there was a slight problem still. It was this, that these guys uh, were remotely accessing, you know, so if once they were out of the hospital, there's no way they could have accessed the image to the hospital, right? Because the scans were done in the hospitals and there's no way sitting in the home they could access all of this. And we figured out, and this is the part that I wanted to talk about. It's just not about sort of doing the AI research, but it's also about building and how you deploy it in real life. And we did was an easy solution. So we figured out what's the most common app that you use throughout the day. I mean, you wake up in the morning, you probably check WhatsApp, right? So WhatsApp was a medium where we said that, yeah, and that's probably the most common thing that everyone uses. So what we did was we took all these radiologists, put them in a WhatsApp group, and as soon as there's an emergency case we figure out, we sort of quickly send it into their WhatsApp group, right, right away. So now, even if there's one radiologist who's busy, who's not able to see, there are other radiologists who can directly see that, and probably they're not the reporting radiologists at that point in time. But they can suddenly see that there's an emergency crisis. You know what? Yeah, just go ahead with the surgery. They can report it right away, then and there. So that's the beauty of AI and frugal innovation, if you call it, which is, you know, build AI and also take it out in the real world, solve real problems, because this is India. You would not get super high internet connection and all of those fancy things that you would expect globally, right? In US, it's a fancy thing. But in India, where the problem really is there, to solve those problems, you need innovative methods to solve that as well. And finally, uh, I wanted to talk about, just could you go to the previous slide. So finally, this message that I wanted to sort of convey is that, as I mentioned, AI is science, right? And for solving any science problem, you need the skill set, but you also need the dedication. 
and passion to solve that, right? If I had not been passionate enough for solving the tuberculosis problem or, you know, catering for the healthcare of so many uncatered population within India, I probably might not have been able to reach there. So now it's your turn. In India, we have a lot of problems. Uh, and those are in your agriculture. There's, there's a problem in drug discovery. There's also space exploration problems. So choose your problems. You have your entire variety. And India doesn't lack problems, that's for sure. So please, go ahead, build your solution because AI is like a magic wand. And if you can just go to this. So this is a slightly old quote that I had repurposed. So imagine AI like your magic wand, right? It's a magic wand, trust me. You can solve almost any problem that you want to set your eyes on and you can solve it. It's just that you still need to know your spells, which means you still need to know the techniques. You just cannot go in and feed in data because that would not work. You still need to understand how the world actually makes that decision to sort of model it in AI. But if you know all of that and you have the dedication, you would be able to solve any problem that you want. And the best part, anyone can do it. You just need a small start with maths or coding, but that's about it. Anyone and everyone can do that. So please go out, solve real life problems, and help our country. Thanks.